Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for sticking around on what is the final session of the penultimate day of the Spring One uh, conference. Um, let's jump straight into it. Uh, I know we are between yourselves and beers at the moment. My name is Simon Duffy. I am a product manager at Pivotal Labs. Uh, I've been working with startups and enterprises for about 13 years, uh, eight of which I've been building products, both in Australia and in the US. Uh, I was the product manager helping build the uh, app, which is the protagonist of the case study that we'll be exploring today. And uh, I'm David Julia, a director with Pivotal Labs. Also, I've been focusing on helping large enterprise customers uh, change the way that they build software, specifically uh, over the past handful of years, focusing on a lot of decomposing the monolith, uh, rewriting legacy applications. Um, I was also involved in this project uh, overseeing the team that was the protagonist of this story. So David and I will be presenting a case study on how we approach a pretty common technical challenge in the enterprise today. And that is how to incrementally and with minimal risk perform a legacy monolith application rewrite to take advantage of modern architecture, cloud infrastructure, as well as building out some new business features. We'll provide an overview of our product, the challenge we found ourselves in, how we pivoted to a data-driven approach, steps on how we executed this, and we'll wrap with some key learnings. I'll primarily talk to the product management-related aspects, and David will talk to some of the implementation and engineering components. So a quick raise of hands. Uh, how many in the room uh, have experienced a application rewrite in their careers? A large number. OK, so this is going. some of these things are going to sound uh, fairly familiar. In our particular scenario, we were working with a large health insurance company, and we were tasked with extending the capability uh, of a particular component of the monolith. Our product would estimate the cost for an individual that they would pay for medical procedures, and the impact that it would have on their health insurance coverage elements. For example, the amount of uh, impact to the deduction, co-insurance, co-pay, et cetera. So if you needed a knee replacement, here's how much it would cost for different providers within a given area, and what does it mean for your health insurance coverage for the remainder of that year? The accuracy of the estimate was incredibly important. If the procedure estimate that we provided back to the user was, say, $100, the user acted on that information, went to see a doctor, and ended up being $1,500, then the, then the health insurance company would typically pay out that difference uh, to, to the member not to mention the pretty poor user experience that that would create. So let's take a look for a second at the existing application architecture at a really high level. We had a third-party web UI that was talking directly to this very large monolithic application. And that monolith was in turn talking to uh, actually about a dozen or so different source systems in order to get the answer for the cost estimate. Now, jumbled inside that big monolithic application was actually a whole mess of functionality, not just the cost estimation piece that we're focused on today. There was, uh, this was really the main member-facing web UI for all of the members of this health insurance company. There was a store of members, there was a secure messaging capability, a bunch of stuff around you know, showing different accounts, different things based on customizations that had been built up over the years. Uh, and a whole mess of other things from getting claims to showing your benefits data and all sorts of stuff. So we'll be focusing mainly on one bit, which is the member liability estimator SOAP service component. So the web UI that was a third party system uh, spoke directly to this SOAP service. And that SOAP service in turn spoke to those uh, 12 or so other legacy systems, source systems that I was referring to earlier. So our challenge and our, our focus for this project was really around replacing that uh, and not disturbing the rest of the system. So some additional context. The monolith programmers, programmers have long since left the company. There's no system documentation at all. And we were heavily reliant on a single expert that had been working with the system over a number of years. We had a, a level of, a, of understanding of the monolith to know that change was super risky. And the investment in, in, in old technology just, just kind of wasn't worth the effort. So we committed to a rewrite to a cloud native app that would enable us to incrementally build out the new business features that we're wanting to deliver. 
So how do we do that? Uh, as the product manager in a balanced team, I'd work very closely with our expert. And she would describe the behavior of the system and surface the detailed logic of how these complex calculations were performed. She would also describe all the various uh, system integrations that we needed to perform and what all of the different fields meant. Due to the complexity of the calculations, we were incredibly lucky to have this expert on our team. Otherwise, to be honest, I don't even know how, how we'd begin to start. So myself and the expert would work together. We'd break down these calculations into small user stories. We'd hand those off to our engineers who would then develop those. And then we would manually compare the result that our app was performing against that of the monolith system. This was working pretty well as the team was ramping up after a couple of months. We had the, the core happy paths uh, through some of these calculations down. However, as we started to, to unpack the nuance of a lot of the alternate flows uh, through the system, uh, things started to get a little tricky. I recall on one day, we were looking at a 6,000 line XML response from a source system. And that included the information of the relationship between the individual member and between the insurance policy that they had. There was a particular field in this 6,000 line XML response that was key in defining that relationship. And as we were uncovering a few issues, we realized that we were using this field incorrectly. This was a bit of a shock for us. It was such a basic core field. Uh, and finding out that we had got that wrong, it shook our confidence and we were wondering, what are all of the other things that we've possibly got wrong? Of course, as it was over the preceding weeks, similar scenarios started to surface. And it ultimately made the team question our understanding of all of these different calculations. While we're uncovering, uh, uncovering all of these different anomalies, we're also trying to work out how do we deploy into prod. It surfaced that we need to undergo about four weeks of QA testing for any major change to a production system. This was primarily due to a very manual approach to QA testing, coupled with a healthy dose of, of risk management um, due to the fi financial liability that the insurance company would take on if we got this wrong. The enterprise QA testing team was a separate team to ours, and we were competing with a whole bunch of other projects for their resources and priority to take on some of this testing work. This was hugely concerning for us. You know, we were driving towards continuous delivery. We wanted to be deploying daily, if not hourly. Naturally, with more testing comes more test case creation and generation. And the team was manually producing uh, all of these test cases. The problem being that we can only ever produce test cases um, to a degree in which we know and understand them. We simply cannot uh, create and replicate the variety of different scenarios that occur in a production environment. So test case generation was incredibly consuming, and we just didn't have the confidence in the test coverage. So here we are. It's a few months into this rewrite. Our understanding of our product has deepened. It's this combination of these unknown business rules, large lead times on QA, lack of robust testing. It was starting to cause a lot of nervousness within the team. So one evening, we were sitting around. We were sharing with David uh, some of the frustrations that we were facing. And we started to think about how can we approach solving this problem differently? Yeah, so the team was quite frustrated. It, it really seemed that before they had this energy and confidence to them, they had this expert that they felt comfortable relying on, and all of a sudden, uh, they just didn't know how to proceed confidently. It was the sense that you know, we don't even know how much there is to do. We don't know how close we are or how far we are. You know, how much progress have we really made to date? Which is not really a, a good feeling for you to have as a team. Uh, the real reason why the team was so frustrated and, and was you know, questioning where they even were was that they didn't have direction in terms of what needed to be built. We didn't have a good way to say, you know, we're X percent of the way done, we need to do the following things, and we'll be Y percent of the way done. So a handful of ideas started swirling through my head during this conversation. Uh, tools and techniques and patterns that are familiar that maybe if we just did a slight twist could help us solve these issues. So the familiar tool that I immediately reached for was the Strangler application or the Strangler pattern. I'll go into that and then I'll talk to you for a bit about the variation that we used that solved our problem around what the heck ought we build next. 
so the strangler pattern gets its name from strangler figs, which are these vines that grow around trees and wrap their way and coil around those trees, uh, bit by bit, growing, 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 and sucking all of the nutrients and, and suffocating the tree, strangling the tree that was its host. And then it leaves just a hollow inside of the strangler fig. So uh, no more tree. Similarly, when we're talking about the strangler pattern in software development, it's a very analogous process. So you have a big legacy system, and you want to build a fancy new microservice on the side of it. So you inject a router in front of your legacy system. So this proxy or router will uh, decide on, a, on any given request which system to route to. Initially, you're going to be routing a whole heck of a lot of requests to your legacy system because it has all of the behavior that your end consumer needs. But bit by bit, you start implementing the new behavior that you want to port over in your new system. And gradually, you start routing more and more traffic as you support more and more use cases to your new system. Eventually, your old system doesn't do anything at all. And you turn off the connection entirely, decommission the legacy system much like the vine strangling the tree and leaving a hollow where that legacy system once was. So the strangler pattern is really, really great for decomposition. It allows you to incrementally get to where you want to be if you know where you want to be. Uh, rather than doing a big bang rewrite and spending 18 months before you even have any traffic flowing through your new system, you're able to gradually, gracefully roll out your, your new system and de-risk the deployment thereof. However, it doesn't solve the problem of us not knowing what to build in our new services, of us not understanding all the rules, the logic, the fields, the mappings that go into creating a cost estimation. So that's where this new approach, this data-driven strangler pattern comes in. What the data-driven strangler pattern is is a unification of two concepts. The idea of the strangler pattern, the original one, along with the idea that you can dynamically co collect data and analyze that data in real production systems to then help guide the way that you implement your system going forward and to give you continuous and realistic feedback about how your new system would perform in production. And that idea, at the end of that conversation, made us really, really happy because we knew we were really onto something. We immediately felt like we had a new, a new approach that was going to get us from a place of uncertainty down the finish line. Oops, there we go. So what does this actually look like? Um, well, the first step here, week one, we decided that we would inject a, a proxy uh, that we nicknamed Project X because we thought our idea was so cool. And we put that in between the third-party web UI and our monolithic application. And all we did to start was we logged every single request and response that went into the monolithic application and came out of the monolithic application. And what this did was it actually gave us a picture of the true traffic pattern, the true data, and the variation on the data that was coming in in production. And this really helped product out. Yeah, it certainly did. This, this initial step provided a huge amount of value to understand the product that we were delivering and gave us two immediate quick wins. Firstly, we gained this detailed insight into the utilization of the monolith. We could clearly identify all of the different types of calculation requests that were coming through the system. We were finding out about all of these new scenarios that we had just never even anticipated. And importantly as well, we could sharpen our feature prioritization by focusing in on those requests of high volume. Secondly, we now had this vast set of test cases that we were able to leverage that represented real production data. So far less time and effort on test data prep. All right, so the next step after that was to actually call into our existing calculation module. So up until that pivotal conversation, we had actually built up quite a bit of calculation code that would uh, calculate a cost estimate. We just weren't wholly confident in what it was doing. So the next step, uh, we, rather than just logging the request and response in, in and out of the monolith, actually for every single request that came into Project X into our system, we would 
send it to the monolith, as well as send it to our new calculation module. Then, on the way back out, we would log the results. So you would have all of the data requests and responses from both systems collected in our metrics database. Again, this was now hugely powerful for, for product because they could perform analysis to see what all the cases were. And they also could get a sense of how quickly we were matching or how far away we were from matching the legacy system, which was our baseline. The next step was actually to automate some analysis. It got to be pretty tedious for product to go through and do a lot of this manual analysis work. So we would have our Project X module start to compare and flag the different requests and response pairs. So if our, our calculation module returned a different result than the legacy application, we would flag that in the database, and that would actually greatly simplify product life when they were going to analyze and see how close we were to matching. And this is only about three weeks into this pivot to a new approach. I like how David from the engineering side is making it sound like he's doing all this amazing work for this product team over here that's not doing much, but it was kind of the case. <laughs> um, so he's right, automation uh, of, the of the comparison between the results of the old system and the new was a huge efficiency gain for us. We can now query our, our database for cases marked in error rather than having to manually assess every single case that came through, uh, of a lot of which were, were, were correctly matched at this point in time. So in effect, we were testing at scale, in near real time, in production, using production data, and we weren't putting any of the, the risk into our users' hands because through that process, we were continually defaulting back to the response that our existing baseline system, i.e. the monolith, was returning. The other interesting part is this started to allow us to produce some aggregate metrics on the performance that our team was uh, delivering based on business outcomes as opposed to the work that we were undertaking. So let's have a look at this. Uh, what we're looking at here uh, is a, key, a, a picture of a key metric that we were tracking during our delivery. On the vertical axis uh, is the percentage of matched cases, and on the horizontal axis is time. On each of those different sticky notes, which hopefully you can see, is a number that represented the percentages of match cases that would occur on a particular day. So naturally, our goal was to move this up and to the right, i.e. we would have a high rate of match calculations between the old system and the new over time. Now, as this metric was produced, it immediately became the metric that we all cared about. Velocity, volatility, story cycle time, all the things. While these are great reference points to assess team's performance, how much of that actually matters if we weren't delivering accurate calculation outcomes? So we had a better metric that we thought was more reflective of the value that the team was delivering. It also allowed us to, to start to have really cool conversations with our stakeholders uh, on the financial risk of deploying our app into production and shutting down the monolith. We were able to put a dollar value on what we thought it would cost to deploy into prod and entirely turn off the monolith by applying the following formula. And that was the percentage of error cases that we just talked about in the slide before, multiplied by the average difference between the calculation from the old system and the new information that we had logged, and lastly multiplied by the average number of requests per day. So that combined gives us this possible financial impact that the health insurance company would be taking on if they deployed in, into, in the new and got rid of the old. It's worthwhile calling out that one challenge that we faced as we were performing all of this testing was that we started to identify scenarios where the monolith was wrong. Now, this provided further validation that rewriting the application was the right way to go. However, it was causing some complications in how we were measuring success because we were inflating our error rate calculations and hence the expected financial cost of our production deployment. We couldn't fix the monolith, so we started to spend a whole bunch of time and effort manually working around these different uh, false positives that we were finding. It was super time consuming, it wasn't particularly accurate, and again, we were trying to find ways of kind of how can we create efficiencies in this process. Yeah, so the next step logically on the engineering side was to start to strangle away those false positives. So up until this point, we had always been 
defaulting back to the answer from the legacy system whenever there was a mismatch. We were purely using this proxy as a way to collect information and validate that we were building in the right direction. Now, all of a sudden, we're starting to strangle away bits and pieces of that legacy application. We started with something that was incredibly low risk. We knew that the false positives we were getting were wrong in the legacy system. And so it was very low risk and an easy conversation to have to say, well, ought we not deploy something that is strictly better and route traffic just in the cases of those false positives to our new calculation module? And this was only about a month or so in. And so that gave us quite a bit of confidence. We started to say, well, if we're already routing traffic to our calculation module, we're already really truly depending on it in production, why not look at exploring routing more traffic to that for those cases that we've seen that week over week with many tens of thousands of data points have always matched between our legacy system and our new system. So we strangled off a bit more of that monolithic calculation module. So after progressively strangling these calculations of high confidence, we're reaching this point where our stats were telling us we're about 90% accurate in terms of comparison from the old to the new. And this was about the threshold where the possible financial impact was equivalent to about the cost of maintaining the legacy component. We also knew that we were probably overstating what this cost was under the assumption that there were a few more of these false positives that we'd get to surface. So we started having a, a very real conversation around how do we shut down the monolith calculation capability. Typically, legacy system cutover conversations are a kind of big deal. However, this turned out to be a very, very simple decision. Referencing the metric that we uh, talked about early, earlier, we had a clear view on how to make that call. Is it cheaper to accept the possible financial risk of deploying our new app as per our calculation, or maintain the, mon the, mon the cost of uh, maintaining the, the legacy monolith? And so, we shut it down. And by it, of course, I'm referring to the uh, legacy monolith calculation component. Yeah, so that was actually re really straightforward to do from an engineering perspective. Uh, all you did was take away the connection from our Project X proxy module to the monolith. You cut off that path, and now every single request was flowing through our new module. And that actually strangled off a really large portion of that monolith. We essentially did not need to use the cost estimation SOAP service in that big legacy monolithic system, which was really huge. And we had a reusable service now. And that was only about uh, 13 or so weeks after this pivot to the new approach. But <laughs> shortly after we did that, the team started to get another icky feeling that, uh, wait a second, now we don't have that uh, sight to what is our goal anymore. We don't have that confidence that we're proceeding in the right direction. Before, as long as that graph that Simon showed you was moving up and to the right, meaning we, weren't, we were having fewer and fewer error cases, then we were making progress. If we saw a dip in that graph, we had a re regression that we ought to fix. Now, well, we don't really have that anymore, so how do we know if we push a change into production if we didn't just break a whole bunch of stuff and cost the company a bunch of money? Which was not a very good feeling to sit with as we wanted to continue to deploy at a very, very fast rate. So we lost our baseline, and that was the core of the issue. So we thought, you know, what if we could become our own baseline? And what I mean by that is, what if our existing production system, whatever is in production today, why don't we consider that our baseline? And then future deployments should be compared against that, and we would only push through changes that we know to be good, like if we're fixing a bug or uh, changing the way a calculation ought to be done. So, Towards the tail end of this, we started down another path, which was actually let's baseline against our production system. 
So what we did in order to bootstrap this, you would extract thousands of requests and responses from our database that Project X dumped those uh, request response pairs into. Dump those into a file, store those into a secure artifact repository, and there you go, you have your baseline. And you could use that in the pipeline, our continuous delivery pipeline. This is a really simplified version, but it illustrates the point. So our pipeline now became build and test, deploy your new candidate application to a staging environment, run a test, a baseline variance test that I'll explain in a second, then deploy to production if you pass that test. And once you're in production and you have sufficient data, take a new baseline and the cycle continues. All right, so a closer look at that baseline variance test. That file that we had had thousands and thousands of requests and responses from real production traffic. We would, in our baseline variance test step of our build, in parallel, hit our candidate application and staging with thousands of requests in parallel, and we would compare. Does it match the response that we were uh, expecting to get that was recorded in that file from a previously deployed production version? If everything matches within some tolerance, let it through, you're good. Uh, and actually, within some tolerance is really key here, because you might have some, some different uh, data that comes about, different policies changed over time. So we actually applied that same formula in our pipeline. Uh, is the financial risk that we calculated per our, our formula earlier greater than the business's tolerance for financial risk? If, if our uh, variance is within tolerance, just go ahead and push through. Uh, we also had to account for the fact that occasionally we'd fix a bug or two, and that was a known good change that we could force through. And so we started to think of our system as being able to baseline itself and as being uh, sort of a self-policing system, almost like a snake eating its own tail. And that actually gave us, again, the confidence that we could deploy really, really quickly, we could move fast, and we wouldn't break anything, and we wouldn't cause significant financial impact to the business. Okay, let's uh, quickly wrap with a few key learnings and, and a final takeaway. Um, what are some of our key learnings as we, we grappled with this product for, for six months? The first is embrace building integrity into your system, yeah, a sometimes forgotten principle of, of lean software delivery. If QA is challenging continuous delivery, lean into that complexity. We were, we were able to understand QA needs and find a solution that solved for their concerns and for continuous delivery. Secondly, an appreciation that sometimes you just can't get to a satisfactory answer with traditional analytical techniques. Find smart ways to solve your problems while working around your practical limitations. Thirdly, steering the conversation towards metrics that tracked against business value allowed the team to focus on the important stuff and our stakeholders understand what they were getting as opposed to what work we were doing. With some of those uh, important business metrics, build them into your pipelines. Is the risk of your production deployment within a certain business tolerance? Automate that. And finally, you're never going to get 100% uh, like-for-like -like with a complex monolith rebuild. Accept it, apply pragmatism over perfection. So I want to make sure that I leave everyone with a couple key takeaways. And really, if you take away nothing else, aside from the beautiful advice that Simon just gave, I want to send you home with some patterns. Both variations of the Strangler pattern, both the, the original one as described and this data-driven variation, the architecture is relatively similar in terms of dependencies. You have a consumer, you inject a proxy layer, and in the case of the original, you dispatch to one or the other. In the case of the data-driven Strangler, you dispatch to both, at least for some time. They look very similar architecturally. From a process flow perspective, from a uh, sequence diagram perspective, if I were to draw one of those, it does look a bit different. So the original Strangler pattern, a request comes in, 
you route it to either the old system or the new system, depending on which system supports that bit of functionality at that time. If your new system supports the functionality, route to the new, otherwise route to the old. And then reply back with the response from whichever system you route it to. Okay. Use the original Strangler pattern if you have a system that you want to decompose and you have a good understanding of the logic inside of it, and you're truly confident that you have a good understanding, unlike us, where we assumed we did and then quickly found out that we did not. So the other time when you really want to use the original Strangler pattern is also when you have the capability to redefine the business process. And maybe the, the process as it is today uh, isn't critical that you replicate exactly. Maybe you have an expert on hand who can just say, throw away the old process, implement this new one, it'll be great, and the business signs off on it. Then if, if you have that, it's probably lower cost not to go down that data-driven strangler path and implementing all of that analytical infrastructure. Right. All right, the data-driven strangler process, process flow. Consumer request comes in, you log the request, you then call into both your old system and your new system. You log the responses. You analyze the results. And you reply back with your known good system. In the case of the beginning, that was our legacy system. And eventually, if you build confidence, you identify false positives. In some cases, that'll be your new system. You ought to consider using the data-driven strangler if you want to decompose a system and you really don't have a good handle on the logic inside of it and how the inner workings are, are tied together. And this is key, don't use the data-driven strangler unless it really is important that the output of your new system matches the output of your legacy system. Yeah, so we'd love a bunch of feedback on our talk. Uh, thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, I don't know. Do we have a couple minutes? No, we're done. Uh, we're done. Okay, cool. Well, if you have, <laughs> if you have questions, we're here after. Thanks. <laughs>